I want to stand up. I want to speak up. I want to speak up for radical self-acceptance, for radical self-love, because that's the story of my journey. That's the story of my transition. I'd like to share some things with you today that I had to learn along the way, things that I had to understand, things that I had to practice, things that I've had to work to integrate, and I think things that have made me more whole. I'd like to share a poem with you that I wrote a few years ago. I think it captures some of the feeling of my experience. It's called A Single Page. I am writing a letter. My whole life, a letter. Not about sight, for I am blinded, darked, but about vision and remembering, my whole life remembering. This is beyond frame, touch point, any familiar marking. Words once clear are now as a blank sheet. Even the corners so neatly creased lie pressed as thin, as dangerous, as uneventful as a single page. I am writing a letter, my whole life, a yearning, a reaching, small in the shadow of a tree, a rock, a stick, a boy standing, his back exposed. The color's a clue. He is lulled in the garden's damp. It's reckless wonder. A million tiny things in the dirt, in a puddle, in the grass, in the branches team. I am writing a letter my whole life. The same I began before she was born, before the music of the wind faded, before the hardest footfall broke the sleep, beat the drum, thrummed the dream of love into hiding. And I surrendered, but did not sign. When I was about eight or nine years old, and my parents' marriage was slowly falling apart, deteriorating in the shadows of the night. And long after all we kids had gone to bed, I had a dream that I've carried with me all these years. In the dream, I'm trying to make my way over a mountain of rubble, the result of a terrible bombing. I'm in the midst of a devastating and threatening war but I'm not alone. I hold the hand of a little girl about my age, and she's so familiar, feels as if she's such a part of me that I never want to be without her. And then she disappears, and I'm alone, lost, calling for her, searching. But she is gone, and I awoke. I woke to the morning, and the sun shined into the room I shared with my brother, and I cried as only a child can. I felt as if something had been taken from me. And I so yearned for her. I so wanted to be back with her that I tried and tried to go back to sleep. But of course I couldn't. She was gone. It was about this time that I started experiencing panic attacks, late at night when the house was quiet, and the darkness would bear down upon me, and the space would beat like drums in my ears, and I felt like I could not escape, like something was coming to get me, something ominous, something impending something dangerous. I remember one night, and I couldn't sleep, and I was trying to hold back this panic, and I noticed the street lamplight shining through the transparent curtains that hung on the window over my brother's bed. They billowed out on the breeze. 
And on that breeze, I heard a woman's voice. And she gently told me that I would be okay. People often ask me if I knew I was transgender when I was young. I did not. But looking back now and recreating the story of my journey, I can clearly see that when I felt most alone, when that little girl had gone into hiding, my soul came to me in my time of need. No one needed to explain that. And even as I survived the debris of my parents' marriage and made my way in the world, there was always a yearning a peace missing, and I was always searching. With the exception of my tumultuous 20s, I went on to lead a reasonably happy life. I married an amazing partner. I raised two wonderful kids in a beautiful home, walking distance to the beach in Santa Cruz. I even built a white picket fence. I had a good job. I thought I had it all. Yet just over seven years ago, I fell apart. My son had left for college in August, and within a month, I was in a state of fight or flight every day, all day. The drums of terror from my childhood beat once again in my ears, but this time I understood that it was the hammering of my own heart that the threat came from within, and that it was a threat to me and to my family and to everything that held meaning for me. I couldn't get a moment's peace from this unnamed thing that was eating me from the inside out. I had pushed it so far down, I didn't even know what it was. Anxiety became depression, Depression, despair, and really out of hopelessness, I finally confided in a friend that I had been thinking about ending my life. Things were bad. But in that opening up to her, in that truth telling, I believe that the seeds of my rebirth were planted. My friend Jane made me promise to call someone for help. She even gave me a name. And even though it took me a long time looking at that phone in my office to make that call, I made the call. Opening up to the help of others is one of the great lessons of my life, of this journey. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the family and the friends, the counselors, the doctors, who met me where I was and helped me forward. And isn't that what the suffering is for? The pain? Wasn't I brought to my knees and humbled before this life so that I could be lifted up by the grace and love of others? I had to open up. The lid was coming off, and I had to face it, but I couldn't face it alone. Opening up was just the entry point. It took me almost another three years to break down all the barriers to the truth that I had built. Ralph Waldo Emerson tells us that we know the truth when we experience it. And I believe he's right. But there was a kind of receptivity that I had to cultivate. There was a kind of listening that I had to participate in so that I could hear my fearful truth. I had to listen through the old scripts that were there to protect but had outlived their usefulness. I had to learn to hear that voice that made me feel excited that brought me wonder, that sang the song of me, that restored my hope. 
This involved paying attention to my dream language, listening beyond the chatter of my thinking brain, beyond the negative and fearful stories that I had come to believe. I dreamed of looking in a mirror and seeing a woman. I dreamed of seeing a woman and realizing that I was she. I dreamed of running home exuberantly in a skirt, feeling like the it girl, <laughs> until confronted by someone who represented the world of rules. And then I wept. I wept for shame. I wept for forgiveness, for the sin of being happy. I was meditating one day, and my mind was quiet. And in the darkness, I saw the image of a box. And I heard my inner voice very clearly and with some emphasis say, let me out of the box. Not a closet exactly. <laughs> I don't recall all of the details of how I came to understand what part of me wanted out of the box, nor the exact moment that I was illuminated by this truth. But there were many moments of clarity and recognition, and as I learned to listen, I came to understand. Opening up, listening up, letting go of resistance, all of these paved the way to the truth. But knowing the truth wasn't enough if I couldn't be present with it. And each day as I became increasingly clear about who I am and what this lifelong yearning had been, I was challenged to show up. To be fully present with the truth that I am a woman. I spent two years trying to subordinate this truth to my life, to my marriage, to the identity that I had spent a lifetime building. And this was the most difficult part of my journey. The tension between the truth's compelling promise of a new life and the life that I had built with my partner ultimately proved impossible to mediate. Yet I tried to walk the middle path, deferring the dream of transition to the responsibility I felt to my family, to my partner, to the life that we had so carefully and magically created. The internal battle, however, became an external battle. And my denial that I am indeed a trans woman and the denial that my path of development led down a divergent road finally wore thin. I realized that when I felt truly happy, when I felt truly whole, was when I invited her to step out of the box. When I fully embodied her, when I gave sway to everything that comes with her, I felt alive. I felt joy. I felt real. I had to learn to love what is. I had to learn to love myself, to love that which I had feared. I remember when I first told my daughter about some of what I was experiencing, some of what I was feeling, and at that time I framed it as a burden, as something I needed to overcome. And I can remember her looking across the car at me and saying, well, uh, maybe it's not a burden. Maybe it's a gift. I couldn't see it as a gift. I couldn't see it as the blessing it truly is until I could fully inhabit it. And only in learning to be completely present with my whole self could I understand this emerging identity and receive the miracle of it. 
The ways of creation are mysterious and beyond my understanding. But that doesn't mean they were without purpose or meaning. A couple months ago, my sweet friend Bo said something like this to me. He said, you know, if you hadn't had to trek the badlands, if you hadn't had to cross those deserts, if you hadn't had to descend into the deep chasms and jump over the pits, if you hadn't had to carry that big bag of rocks, you wouldn't have been strong enough to climb the mountain when you got there. True that. I now understand that part of the purpose of my arduous journey was to help me cultivate the strength, the fortitude, the resilience, and the drive to make it up the mountain. It's so hard sometimes when we're in the midst of our sojourn to see the meaning inherent in our trials and our travails. But there are things in this life for which we must prepare, for which we must train, for which we must build up. One of the greatest gifts of my journey and my transition has been the love and support that I've received from my friends and colleagues. I went home last August after speaking up at the staff meeting, after sharing my truth, and I was, I was overcome with joy. I was overflowing with happiness. I had crossed the threshold and there to meet me with open arms were my friends and my colleagues. I said a prayer of gratitude for this community. I thanked life for teaching me how to receive, for showing me the grace that comes with acceptance, for showing me the joy that comes with living in alignment with truth. Likewise, my students have been remarkable. These kind young people give me hope. They give me solace in a complex and sometimes daunting world where all too often we lose sight that each of us has our own truth, that each of us has been blessed with a particular perspective, a unique reflection of creation, of life. I've shared with you some of the things that I've learned along this journey. Opening up, listening up, showing up. And all of these led me to this one fundamental truth. Self-acceptance. Self-love. Love. love. When we love ourselves, we better love others. When we listen with love, we call to others to speak their truths. When we offer ourselves up as we are in love, we bring out the best in the people around us. And when we speak up to that which is truest and highest in each of us, we invite others to speak up to. My mother recently wrote me a letter. It's her love language. And in closing, she wrote, keep looking up. What else are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs>